As we start our second edition tonight, your story is about a time in America when forced sterilization was allowable by law and in our lifetimes. Legal in the United States and 31 states as a way to sort of cull the genetic herd, one woman has stepped up to the system and we're going to tell her story tonight. We're also going to go to Richard Engel tonight to tell us all why every American needs to care about what just went down in Greece and what may be about to go down in Italy. A lot of people say that the Greeks just don't like paying their taxes. Yes, of course. Greek people think that, ah, I don't have nothing, I don't want to pay nothing. Your piece last week, Boomtown, we had a lot of questions that, that stem from your story, from environmental impact, mm -hmm. what is this stuff they've found, right. how many folks can Williston, North Dakota, absorb? Right. I'm ready to answer every one of those questions. And later. Yes. On this couch. Yes. Tina Fey, perhaps the leading woman in the entertainment industry in this country. And Tina, I'll just put it this way, has had her share of fun with some of us on her show. God, what does that man do in here? I don't know. I've never met Brian Williams, but his dressing room has to be cleaned up every day between 11 and 11.30. That way, by the time Mr. Williams gets back from the liquor store, it's nice and tidy. Good evening and welcome to Rock Center. You used to hear people say in terms of the massive U.S. economy, when America sneezed, the rest of the world got a cold. They don't say that too much anymore. In fact, right now, we can't be around anyone sick because we're too highly susceptible to infection. Well, tonight we begin with the trouble in Greece and maybe now Italy and how it reaches right into your American retirement account. The Greek economy, for starters, is about the size of Washington State. Greece has roughly the same population as the state of Ohio, but they are in so much trouble and the problem is so globally connected, it will affect America's money. We sent our chief foreign correspondent, Richard Engel, to Greece to try to explain this mess to the same folks you often hear say, it's all Greek to me. If the world has a financial meltdown, Greece could be ground zero. Just don't tell the Greeks. It might spoil their night. That may be a bit unfair, but even some Greeks say they deserve their economic hangover. The party's over. Yes, the party's over. Christina and Christos are the parents of two daughters, and Christina's 75-year-old mother lives with them too. We don't buy any more clothes. Nothing. In the last year, their income is down 30%. Grandma's pension has been cut in half, and the situation is about to get worse. He thinks it's not so good for us. I don't know. You're afraid? Yes. Across town, Vaso, a fashion designer, used to have nine employees. She's down to three. What impact has it had on you personally? A lot of stress. Every day, we are like this. We don't know what happened. Tomorrow. The first chords of trouble were struck in 2002 when Greece adopted the euro. That enabled the country to borrow at low interest rates with wild abandon. The 2004 Athens Olympics ran up the tab. But economists say most of the borrowing paid for bloated salaries and benefits at state owned companies. Around Athens, stories abound. Some utility and railroad workers making six figures, others retiring on full pensions at 45. Those days of easy living and easy money are gone, long gone. This is what downtown Athens looks like almost every night now with anti-government demonstrations. This one organized by the Communist Party. They want Greece to abandon the euro, saying the country's gotten too expensive and forfeited too much economic independence. To which much of the world responds, stop whining. Greece's problems are its own fault. More than 40% of Greek workers haven't been paying their taxes. A lot of people say that the Greeks just don't like paying their taxes? Yes, of course. Greek people think that, ah, I don't have nothing, I don't want to pay nothing. The schools were bad, the roads were bad. Of course. So people said, why should we pay taxes? Bravo. 
The bubble burst here two years ago when Greece admitted it was hiding a budget deficit three times what it had been reporting. The country's credit rating dropped to the lowest in the world, and now Greece owes a half a trillion dollars. That's a debt of nearly $50,000 for every person. And to get a European-led bailout, Greece was forced to make draconian budget cuts. And even more are coming. 2,000 schools will close. Health clinics, too. I think there has been some political... A 27-year-old PhD candidate named Christos recently returned to Greece from the UK. He's afraid of what he sees. Salaries are being slashed. Schools are being closed. What's going to happen to the society here? I think it's going to keep getting worse and worse until we go back 30, 40 years in terms of living standards. About a quarter of the Greek workforce is employed by the government. Those jobs are being slashed. And for those who keep them, pay cuts. Up to 50% for police, bus drivers, sanitation workers, and teachers like Marilena. A public school teacher for 20 years, Marilena will see her salary reduced by a third. She blames the government for hiring too many people. The result is some of them work and some of them sit because there's nothing for them to do. Now that's the case for hundreds of thousands of Greeks. The official unemployment rate here is over 16 percent. A television journalist who says she hasn't been paid in five months showed me this corner. And this is one of the big intersections in downtown. Yes. And this uh, used to be a fast food restaurant. Next to it, an appliance store yes. closed okay. down. A bookstore, and that one's also closed down. You see every day another shop is closing, another shop is closing. Every, every day. day. This man used to be a waiter. How long have you been looking for a job? Uh, it's about uh, five months now. Five months? Yeah. Nothing? Yeah. And for the returning young PhD candidate, there are signs Greek society is unraveling. I think they've lost all confidence. I know people who are actually taking the money out from the banks and putting them, burying them in their backyards. What did people in Greece think would happen? Didn't they see that this day would eventually come? It happens. Uh, everybody was thinking that uh, that will be forever. Well, of course, forever didn't last, and now Italy is following Greece down the road of political and fiscal upheaval, and as a result, Richard has now made his way from Athens to Rome. Richard, first of all, it's just so nice to see you in a place where you're not getting shot at, but second, if you believe in the domino theory, you just flew today in the course of one day from one domino to the other. Is anyone over there talking that way? Uh, they certainly are. Italians are watching what is happening in Greece, and they don't want what uh, is going on in Greece to happen here, where the economic bubble burst and people are suddenly faced with these draconian budget cuts. We are now in front of the uh, parliament here in Rome. This economic crisis is already costing the Greek prime minister his job, and tomorrow, Silvio Berlusconi, Italy's longtime prime minister, faces a key vote in parliament, and if he loses that vote, Berlusconi could be thrown out of office. Italy's economy is much bigger than Greece's, so deeper instability here will have a much greater impact around the world. And the reason that Italians are want to get rid of Berlusconi, it's really a crisis of confidence. They just don't think he has the credibility. Well, once again, Richard, at least you're where the story uh, appears to be moving. Richard Engel in Rome tonight. Thanks. Michael Lewis is with us tonight from Berkeley, California, and he has become one of the celebrated authors of our generation. The movie form of his book, Moneyball, is now in theaters. He wrote The Blind Side, he wrote The Big Short, Liars, Poker, and now Boomerang, which presciently takes us right where the story is tonight. Michael, first of all, for uh, all of us who are members of a lay audience, how is it that the Greek economy finds a way to reach into our pockets, bank accounts, retirement accounts? It's kind of incredible, isn't it? I mean, not just the Greek economy, but the, the kind of short-term gyrations in Greek politics seems to register immediately in the American stock market. And there, there are a couple of things that are going on. One is that the financial world just it's way too interconnected. Uh, so it, the, the, if Greek, Greece is going to default on this 
half a trillion dollars in government debt, and the people are going to lose money. And the people on the other end of that, the, the it, who've lent the money, are mainly bankers. And the so it, so it throws into question the the solvency of banks, mainly European banks. But the European banks are, of course, connected up to American banks. And so when people see Greece default, they think, oh, my God, the banking sector is going to go down uh, again. Uh, and, but the other thing is, is just, you know, the market is a mood. It's a, and uh, just sort of the general malaise in Europe and the prospect that Greece going down leads to Italy and Spain and bigger economies defaulting on their debts uh, cast his pall over the market. Well, let's um, let's back up so that, two sentences yeah. there. Let's let's do the difference between uh, hearing Greece is in trouble and hearing Italy is in trouble. Well, it's it's just its size. I mean, it, it, if the the Europeans have structured a rescue fund that is being basically rammed down the throats of the Greek people, because it's not clear they want the terms of the deal. Uh, but but the fund is big enough to. To, to probably deal with the Greek losses. It's not big enough to deal with the Italian losses. And the reason for that is that the Germans basically going to end up paying the bill and the German public doesn't want to do it. I mean, there's already outrage in Germany about paying this Greek tab. So the, the, it's very interesting. At the top of, of European politics, you've got elites generating uh, a sort of uh, uh, results that the people uh, who elected them don't approve of. The Germans don't want to bail out the Greeks, and the Greeks don't apparently really want to be bailed out. For an art history major in college, as I once read, you once were, you've gone on to become one of the chroniclers of the economic meltdown, and you've accurately described it, made a handsome living at it as someone who is as steeped in it as you are, What's the one thing you want to shout from the mountaintops, a message that is in all of your books that people aren't hearing, aren't paying attention to? Well, apropos of this crisis, I mean, if you ask why is it that we are so vulnerable to this event, you know, far from our shores, the, the, the answer is that we still have at the center of our life these massive banks that are too big to fail. And they should have been broken up three years ago. Uh, th 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 when their solvency is called into question, it has this massive ripple effect on the economy. And, and why we are sitting here today, three years after the collapse of Lehman Brothers, with, with these institutions that basically have us at their mercy and are at the mercy of the, of the Greek government, uh, you know, is beyond me. I, so what I would shout from the rooftops is, Get out into the streets with the Occupy Wall Street movement and protest. Michael Lewis, the message appropriately from Berkeley, California. Thanks very much, Michael, for being with us uh, on the broadcast tonight. We'll take a break here and up next. As you watch this next story, you will likely ask over and over, how could this kind of thing have happened in this country, in our age? How could people have been sterilized against their will? Dr. Nancy Snyderman introduces us to a victim who has climbed back to reclaim her life. And our guest here in the studio tonight, Tina Fey. First off, we're going to see if her forearms really are that big in person. And we're going to talk about the intentional confusion between the names of our two shows. Most Americans would agree the government has a lot to learn from that physician's oath to do no harm. But it's tougher to explain this. Doctors and government officials conspiring on a project so horrible, it is hard to believe it happened in our country and not that long ago. We have a story here tonight about cruelty in the name of science and about the government in effect trying to play God. But it's also about the strength and resilience of the human spirit and about a remarkable woman named Elaine Riddick. Dr. Nancy Snyderman takes us tonight to North Carolina to investigate a state of shame. The serene charm of Windfall, North Carolina. A sleepy town where the Perquimans River empties into the Albemarle Sound. But buried in the stillness of this place, it seems time has forgotten a secret shame. It was sort of a hush-hush type of thing. And the records and files were all hidden away down in a basement locked under a key. Until this past summer, 
when the ugly truth about what happened here and in towns all across North Carolina could be hidden no more. If there's anyone in this room that's too embarrassed to tell your story, don't be. Tell it. It needs to be told and you need to tell it all. There were a lot of stories that shocked those in the room that day. Stories of shame, confusion, grief. But one story, one single story seemed to rise above the rest. I didn't want nobody looking at me because everybody knew what happened to me. That's how I felt inside. My heart bleeds every single day. I'm crushed. <laughs> they cut me open like I was a hog. <laughs> Elaine Riddick's story began in Windfall, among the cotton fields that rose up to meet the tiny two-bedroom house she shared with her grandmother, affectionately known as Miss Peaches. When you come back here, is it nostalgic? Is it bittersweet? Does it bring up moments of anger? All of the above. Sometime I can come here and I am in... You know, I can look around me and I can take, find beauty in the ugliness, the ugly things that happened to me. It was 1967. Elaine's mother was in prison. Her father had abandoned her and five of her siblings were in an orphanage. Every adult she knew had betrayed her, with the exception of one, her grandmother. She just paid special attention to me. And she loved me. And she just gave me something that I needed. Sorry. But life was about to get worse for the poor, hungry little girl Miss Peaches tried to protect. As I was walking home, I took the long road, and the next thing I know, I was a drug and I was attacked. And you were raped? And I was raped. And my life was threatened that if I ever told anyone, that he was going to kill me. And you were 13? I was 13. That brutal rape resulted in a pregnancy. Nearly nine months to the day of the assault, she went into labor. We got to the hospital and they put me in a room and that's all I remember. That's all I remember. When I woke up, I woke up with bandages on my stomach. Meaning what? At that time, I didn't know what it meant. What she didn't know was that the baby boy she gave birth to that day would be her last. No one told me. I never even knew. She had been sterilized, targeted by a state board that ordered that this kind of surgery be performed on thousands of North Carolinians from 1929 all the way to 1974. 7,600 men, women, and children, determined by social workers to be feeble-minded or promiscuous, were sterilized, usually without their consent, and it was perfectly legal. Little boys, they would castrate them. Little girls, they would go inside them and take out their organs. State Representative Larry Womble. Why would they want to do that to a young girl? Why did they? Well, they had several reasons they thought were valid at that time. Their reasons were based on a scientific theory called eugenics, which became popular in the 1920s. Eugenicists believed that poverty, promiscuity, and alcoholism were inherited traits. It was a simple theory with a radical solution. Sterilize those the state would have to take care of and improve society's gene pool. Some of America's wealthiest citizens of the time were eugenicists. Dr. Clarence Gamble of the Procter & Gamble Fortune and James Haynes of the Hosiery Company founded the Human Betterment League, which produced brochures like these, stoking fears of, quote, morons mixing with the general population. Representative, when you look back, was this a well-intentioned idea with the best science at the time that then just went awry? I don't know if that was the best intention to weed out negative things in our society. You're playing God over a whole group of people's lives. And I don't think we're supposed to play God like that. 31 states had legal eugenics programs. And by the late 1960s, tens of thousands of Americans had been sterilized. It began as a way to control welfare spending on poor white women and men. But over time, North Carolina shifted focus, targeting more women and more blacks than whites. 
It was a monetary, economic thing. Get them off of welfare so the state would not have to pay for their children. That's fine, but you don't do that by doing this kind of thing. Some people have even expressed to me that it borders on genocide. A third of sterilizations were ordered on girls under the age of 18, some as young as nine years old. What in the world will this lady do with yeah. another child? Yeah. I think he's sterilizing the entire caseload. The voices of social workers involved with eugenic sterilization. You're hearing them broadcast for the first time, some of them explaining the decision to sterilize in these recordings made in 1997 by Rutgers professor Johanna Schoon. What chance does another child have mm -hmm. in this family? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of motivation for workers probably came from that. Over a period of a year or two years, he got all of the women sterilized. Mm -hmm. I think that was perhaps a little excessive. In 1968, Americans were rebelling, protesting the Vietnam War, marching for civil rights. And while most states had abandoned their eugenics programs by then, the sterilization of poor Americans was still happening in North Carolina, and no one seemed to notice. So it was for Elaine Riddick that a signature on a dotted line sealed her fate. During the cesarean birth of her only son, her fallopian tubes were cut, and tied off. There is a document in your file that says regarding the sterilization, mm -hmm. grandmother consents and the procedure has been explained to Elaine. Well, how can you take a 13 year old kid and tell them this is what you're gonna do to them? The terminology did not register how can you explain to a 13-year-old kid that you're going to sterilize them? They took something so dearly from me, something that was God-given. Trauma like this would cripple most of us, but in a moment when we continue this story after the break, we see her climb back and what she did for her only son. Again, our story continues right after this. Welcome back as we now get back to our story. For decades, North Carolina sterilized people it deemed unfit, and it did so largely in secret. And now victims like Elaine Riddick are demanding answers from the government. Dr. Nancy Snyderman continues with Elaine's fly, fight to rebuild her life and the state of shame that existed back then in North Carolina. On the fourth floor of a government building in downtown Raleigh, North Carolina, thousands upon thousands of records few have ever seen. These are the eugenics files? Yes, and they're confidential. They're records that are not open to the general public. Thanks State archivist Dick Langford is the keeper of the files that hold the secrets of one of the most controversial practices of modern history, the mass sterilization of Americans against their will. When you've looked at them, what was your initial response? I look at them with a heavy heart because I realize these records, as patient records, have impact on people's lives. When you look at these records, you realize they're from not that long ago, 1950s, 1960s, and they represent all kinds of people. Take this one, for instance, a teenager who was sterilized because she was deemed promiscuous at the age of eight. And here's one, a 16-year-old incest victim. Social workers got consent for her sterilization from the father who raped her. And then there are the records of Elaine Riddick, sterilized after being raped at age 13. Social workers had declared her promiscuous, mentally retarded, unfit to procreate. But Elaine had something to prove. I ended up going to college. I took the entrance exam. I passed. I got in. And she graduated with an associate's degree from a technical college in 1982. Is some of this you saying to them by your actions, you guys were so wrong? Yes, definitely. Definitely. You know, I'm worthy. I'm not that little nappy head, dirty clothes, uh, hungry little girl anymore. I don't know where I would be if I listened to the state of North Carolina. Her proudest achievement has been her son, born 43 years ago and under unimaginable circumstances. Hey, Ma. Hi. Good to see you. Good to see you. Hi. 
Hi, I'm Nancy. Nancy. How are you, Nancy? Nice to meet you. You're Tony. Thank you. Yes, Tony. You're a strapping guy. Thank you. <laughs> Today, Tony Riddick is a successful entrepreneur. You must be unbelievably proud of your mother. Oh, absolutely. I am. This is my buddy, my friend, my mother, everything, my sister. I'm proud of her because she never stopped fighting. You know, she continues to fight, and I think that's very important. What do you want? What do I want? Uh... Well, what do I want? I would like for the state of North Carolina to write what they wrong with me. At one point, I sued the state of North Carolina for a million dollars, and that's been over 30-some years ago. And what did you expect when you filed that suit for a million dollars? I expected for them to give me a million dollars. She got nothing. She lost her case against the state because a jury decided no laws were broken. She appealed it all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, which declined to hear her argument. I was uh, embarrassed and I was surprised. All she and the other 7,600 victims have is an apology, emailed to the Winston-Salem Journal from then Governor Mike Easley in 2002. But after mounting pressure from reporters, the state decided to do more and convened a task force in 2003. Nothing resulted. Then another task force came and went. We're the United States, for God's sakes. <laughs> This was so wrong. Which brings us back to that day last summer when victims and their families had their say in front of another government task force assigned to determine how they should be compensated. What do you think I'm worth? What do you think I'm worth? It doesn't matter what you think I'm worth. It's what I think I'm worth. Priceless. Yes, ma'am. There's nothing that the state of North Carolina can do to justify what they did to me what they did to these other victims. They told me to sign papers. I didn't sign no papers. I ain't never signed the papers. That was not my signature on these papers. North Carolina is the only state to consider compensation in the range of twenty to fifty thousand dollars. But Tony Riddick, standing up for his mother and the other victims, said that's too little, too late. And my mother's been sitting here suffering for 43 years and nothing has been done. This is sinister. And I'm so afraid that they're going to try to wait till all these people die. And that's a shame. That's a mark. It's an ugly chapter in North Carolina's book. We must step up to the plate and we must realize, take responsibility. There is nobody in North Carolina who is waiting for anybody to die again. Bev Perdue is North Carolina's governor. To stand up and say, I want this solved on my watch. I want there to be completion. Is there a plan to help these people? Our plan is, is very uh, thoughtful, I believe. We have gone through the process of, of ha having the hearings. You have to have people who self-report. I can't. Uh, Why? But, I mean, you have the records. I, Why not because, proactively go out and find these people? Because even if you go out and proactively find them, there are lots of people, just like in other medical cases, who don't want their data shared. They even want if to it's know money? It. Nancy, from my perspective, as a woman and as the governor of this state, this is not about the money. There isn't enough money in the world to pay these people for what has been done to them. As the Riddicks await the state's decision, they focus on the part of the family legacy that really matters. There's something to be said about young men who are raised by strong women. Yes, ma'am. I got an, uh, my, my cup overfloweth. <laughs> <laughs> Go! <laughs> Every day they appreciate life's simple gifts, finding joy in Tony Jr., who has yet to understand yeah, his grandmother's place in a terrible chapter of American history. He gives me the love. So with that, I can do anything in the world that I want to do. And I can be anybody I want to be. I'm sitting here thinking, these aren't records you unearthed in a parchment book with right. sketchy details from the past. We just heard audio recordings of something saying, someone saying they sterilized an entire patient load. And, you know, to paraphrase the piece, I'm sitting here thinking, this is the United States, for God's sake. Not only that, these... Procedures were going on in the 60s and 70s, but it was on the books legally until Representative Womble pushed, and it was taken off in 2003. It always raises the question, how after World War II, because something like this even happened in this country, it's dark. I yeah. mean, it, it, it started really as an anti-economic poverty issue towards the poor white women 
and then shifted just that much towards, I think, what a lot of people are seeing as a racial issue. The, the word uh, reparations, people roll their eyes sometimes. It's become red hot. Right. So let's use your word compensation. Right. Because this is so recent, because, you know, I was in high school, this was still going on. Where does it stand now since you were down there? So Governor Perdue told me with her third commission now, she would like mental health to be free for these people, perhaps regular health care for the rest of one's life. But how much money do you give someone? Let's say twenty to fifty thousand dollars seems to be the number that everyone's floating around. Right now, she is a Democratic governor, has a Republican legislature. North Carolina is facing a budget deficit. This is going to come down to, I believe, in 2012, an issue of how do we find the money? Is it money well spent? And frankly, for a lot of the victims, is an apology enough? I think, frankly, this may not come out satisfying people on both sides of the fence. A powerful piece of work. You'll tell us, us. You'll tell us what happens you down there. You bet I will. Thank you. You bet, Brian. Thanks, Doc. A bit later on on this broadcast, Tina Fey will be here with us. 30 Rock meets Rock Center tonight in this very studio. And up next, it was the first story we ever aired all of a week ago. Harry Smith took us to the North Dakota boomtown, where they're hiring just about everybody who shows up in need of a job. So many of you had questions and comments. Harry is back to take it all on again tonight. Well, welcome back to Rock Center Edition 2. We were still on the air last week when we found out that our story on Williston, North Dakota, our first story ever, had struck a nerve. Harry Smith reported last week on the oil boom there that has created a huge demand for workers of all kinds. 30,000 jobs up here have been created. 18,000 jobs, we're estimating unfilled. Uh, That's I how have, many you think are unfilled Unfilled. Right I have one... One friend of mine up here that's looking for 500 truck drivers right now. So as I say, there we were still on the air and via email, Twitter and phone, the questions came in and the comments came in. We found one Harry Smith ever so happy to field all incoming questions. Mm -hmm. First of all, the first thing we got that night was, okay, where, who do I, how do I, <laughs> where do I go? Is there a website? The Is websites, the phones rang off the hook in Williston, North Dakota, the mayor's office, the chamber of oh, commerce. you must be a popular man up I, there. I might be able to run for office there. Yeah. Everybody was inundated, but the one place in particular we mentioned, hospital had 60 openings, there were a $25 yeah. million dollar expansion. They were flooded with applications, and they were really pleased because we helped grow their pool of applicants. They've hired at least six people who they've said, as soon as we find you a place to live, you can come and work for us. Now, a big deal that we did not have time to immerse ourselves in, uh, this is fracking. Mm -hmm. hydrofracking right. and it's it's proven so controversial and environmentally damaging in other parts of the country yet people keep referring to North Dakota as the answer to our energy needs potentially right. why is it any different out there uh, let me just give you a little graphic of what fracking really looks like okay they drill down two miles deep into the earth and then that pipe starts to go sideways, all right? Remember we said last week it's a couple hundred degrees down there. Right. They shoot some water in there with a little bit of sand and a little bit of chemicals at high pressure into that rock and the oil just comes oozing out. Now the only real environmental concern there is what happens to the wastewater. They put it in ponds. There was a flood last spring, some of it got out and some animals were hurt. Beyond that, the larger environmental issue for them in North Dakota is this has always been a pristine, wide open rural landscape. You put 50,000 wells on there, it changes things. And when you bring 50,000 people in, mm. where do those people go? And let's say they're moving in in November. Don't. That's one of the things I talked to the mayor today, and he said, please, please, please. This is what it looks like in Williston in January, mm. in February, mm -hmm. in March. They had a, over 100 inches of snow there last year. They broke a record. If you don't have a place to stay, of which there are precious few, don't come. Take your time, get your ducks in order, 
find if you can, you know, uh, lay your plans with a job and a place to stay, but don't come and expect to sleep in the parking lot, especially when it's that cold outside. Oh, I bet you're real popular out there. <laughs> Harry Smith, our man in Williston, and you're going to go back in the dead of winter and follow up on this. We promise. All right. Thank you, sir. If you'd like to know more about opportunities in Williston, it says here we have resources on our website, rockcenternbc.com. And up next here after a break, like us, Tina Fey was first to realize the ticket to success on television is using the address of this building in your title. Tina Fey of 30 Rock joins Rock Center after this break. There she is. Here are the basics, seven Emmy Awards, three Golden Globes, and most notably to a lot of people, the Mark Twain Prize for American Humor presented at the Kennedy Center in Washington. Tina Fey of 30 Rock is here visiting Rock Center, which made a lot of sense to us, and we welcome uh, a woman commonly known as the preeminent woman in American comedy today. For the record, your forearms are nothing like they are. That You have very Beautiful. feminine, normal forearms. As far as you know. Um, Tina, thank you for doing this. Thank you for having me to your beautiful home. Yes, it is a lovely home. And we should deal with the name issue. Yes. I, I want to be the first to say that in naming this Rock Center, mm -hmm. it was our intention to get the viewers who were looking for, for <laughs> Tina, for Alec, for Tracy, to stop by, like what they see, but come to us entirely mistakenly. <laughs> That's not going to help you. And I can I tell you that right they now. They are similar. The graphic treatment. The graphics are similar. And I'll tell you, this is not a lie. We, when we uh, were first starting the show, we, we wanted to call 30 Rock. We wanted to call it Rock Center. And that was our first choice. Um, and we were told that we were not allowed to call it Rock Center. And we checked with your guys. You have guys. I've got it. We, we've named people, and we had, to, we had to run all the traps and say, would it be okay? And the um, answer came back. That was okay. I don't please. know what's happened, because we were told, no, no, the people who own the building didn't want that. They, we also wanted to call the show, I wanted to call uh, the show The Peacock, because I thought that would be kind of funny, and that Alex's character would be kind of like a peacock, and that we were told that it was a very serious and, uh, you know, important symbol of a big, strong, important network and that we could not use it. And, and thus. We, yes, and my husband kept saying we should call the show Two and a Half Men. Yeah, that was taken. which would have been fine. Appropriate, it would have made yeah. sense. Me, yeah. Tracy, and Alec. Uh, congratulations on the success of 30 Rock. Well, thank you. It's just, just insanely successful television show. Well, we're, we're filming season six right now, and we come back on the air uh, in January, if, you know, if everything's still here. And the <laughs> in, yeah, it will be, I promise. You're, <laughs> Family news is big. Um, daughter Alice has mm -hmm. a little sister named Penelope. Yes. You were kind enough to send us a birth announcement. And what I noted was, like uh, when our uh, kids were young, the, uh, Alice's smile uh, cradling her little sister <laughs> is lovely. There is a maniacal side of, of uh, just a little bit of maniacal side in her smile. They all want to consume their little brother or sister. They secretly. do. They, the for, uh, we spent the. It's funny because you give a kid six year old. You know they've been only child for six years, and then you go literally overnight from they're the center of everything to the, you're just telling them like back up, get off, get off. You <laughs> stop. Get your face off her. Stop touching her. Don't put your hands on there. You're dirty. Wash your hands. Like you're just constantly yelling at them immediately. And she, uh, yes, yeah, she does. Like to come in and like pick her up. Can I pick her? Always asking after the fact. Can yeah. I pick her up? Yeah, I have her yeah. in the room now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you're working just as hard at home. And uh, what are you seeing by way of media? What? Nothing. I when you guys called and said you want to come on and talk about the news, I said you guys tell Brian. I I, I am in. Uh, my head is a diaper. I don't. I have not. I don't know anything's going on in the news. I know we're supposed to prepare for Hurricane Irene. That's, that yep, was the last thing I saw. That's, that safety tip is what we're telling and everyone. And anything beyond that, I, th I hear everything's going great, though. It is. <laughs> and especially in Greece, your it's homeland. Going great. Really nicely done there. Oh, I'm not taking the blame for that. No. <laughs> you're a Greek American. I am, I am half German and half Greek. I am so furious at myself right now yeah. about but, all this well, going on. Well, give it some time. It'll I'm reach everywhere so in Europe. I'm so tired of bailing myself out. Um, when uh, <laughs> we'll take a break when we come back I want to know what life has been like yes. at home watching okay. the world go by if okay. not media or contemporary news 
We're back with Tina Fey right after this. And I also have a question about a quote I read in your book. You didn't read it. Oh, of course I did. We're back with Tina Fey. Here's the quote we mentioned before the break. Egomaniacs of average intelligence or less often end up in the field of TV journalism. Now, what on earth uh, would... Yes. Hear me out. Yep. No, in the book I'm talking about how you, you don't want to, you know, tell anything. If you had anything serious or personal that happened to you, you don't necessarily want to talk about it in an interview because then it's fair game for every interview you do ever right. for the remainder of your short-lived career. So, you know, it's mostly, it's certainly not anyone here, not anyone at the beautiful not NBC. In the building. But there is a certain, uh, you know, if you, if you ever, have you ever done a, a red carpet? It's that kind of oh, great sure, yeah. red yeah. carpet journalism where they're like, you know, why are you here? And, and what are you wearing? And then they'll just all of a sudden, like, out of the blue, be like, what are you wearing? Are you going to have fun tonight at the circus? Now, what do you think about that guy in Arizona who killed all those girls? They do that. They do that to you. Like, yeah. that one time, a lady said to me, um, one time backstage at the Emmys, a pretty good one was, um, I think, it was a year that we'd actually had won something at the Emmys. And uh, she said to me, uh, now, Joan Didion wrote the book, The Year of Magical Thinking. But what a magical year you've had. Oh, wow. That was the transition. <laughs> that was a pretty good transition. Because so much of your writing is Didion esque. Yes. And that's such a happy book. The right. Year of it magical is. Thinking. It wasn't it's about a dark what a, time. It's about what a great year. Anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. Ch there was one time there was, um, hey, how are you feeling tonight? Great. Now, Charlie Sheen went to rehab today. Do you have anything you want to say to Charlie? <laughs> I don't Great. know Charlie sure. Sheen. <laughs> yeah, and you obviously would have tweeted a personal message. Sure, and then you if you're like anything. a jerk, if you don't, if you don't have well wishes. That's right. For Charlie Sheen. What have you been watching? You've been. You have to have. You're a child of television. You're one of us. You're a creature of the I form. I am. I mean, I've been in this weird, like, um, you know, for I was on maternity leave for about uh, like nine days, and so then <laughs> I was, uh, yeah. you watch different stuff because you're up nursing or something in the middle of the night, and you watch like. Um, uh, extreme couponing and uh, cake boss. And then, you know, you you know, it's like your maternity leave's about to end when you're like, oh, I've seen this cake boss. Do you watch any How It's Made? Do you watch any Antiques Roadshow? Do you get you know, into? No, I saw Storage Wars once. I didn't quite get on board. I used to like The Real Housewives a lot, but I I don't like it so much when they're fighting. Which state, dude? Orange County. Atlanta. I only can only do New York and Beverly Hills. Not Jersey. Subhuman. Oh, right, it's you all cannot about be family. happy about how those all people family. <laughs> fambugly, as Rachel Dratch would say. You're my fambugly. Family. It's all about family. <laughs> That's all you need to know. <laughs> but I I find Jersey so I far and seen... away the best of the Oh, it's so oh. rough. I compared to the gentleness of Orange County, Atlanta. I, Orange County, I literally can't tell the women apart. I literally, they look like a fire at a wax museum. I can't tell what I'm looking at in Orange County. It's so nice. So nice. For them. But, um, to be a fire at a wax museum. Yeah. <laughs> what else? What else is going on? Uh, Andy, you're a fan of Andy Cohen. Well, you know, I, I've done that show. I think it's like, you know, like this show, it reminds me of old timey TV where you just go, kind of go in. I mean, the, you, are, you do get a little um, boozed up on that oh, show. No. Tap water yeah. here. But I do think I'm a little worried about the Real Housewives franchise. I don't need them to fight all the time. Without that, they don't have television. I just want to see their weird houses. Um, thank you for visiting us in hours. It this was very kind of you now that the nice kids are in bed. <laughs> and uh, our thanks to uh, Tina Fey for visiting us here on the second ever okay. Rock Center. You did very well, I think. That's all for us. We'll be back next week. I'll see you tomorrow night on Nightly News. Your late local news begins now.